My name is Eddie Funkster. Uh, allegedly, they're making me a professor at San Diego State University. I'll be teaching the clinical side of Proposition 215. That's helping cancer and AIDS patients uh, deal with terminal, terminal issues like uh, how to deal with passing chemotherapy and all of these uh, heavy atrocities that they do in Western medicine to make us believe that we're not guinea pigs. So I've, I'm going to teach that part of it, and I do a lot of work with uh, doctors and researchers over the last 25 years working with Proposition 215. Um, Dennis Perone is a very good advocate and a major mentor of me in, in the movement of understanding on how to deliver what is important, and that's the healing of the people that don't get a lot of health care, a lot of care in the health care system. So I hope you guys uh, bear with me. I hope I do pretty well for you guys. So a quick thing about myself is uh, I'm from here, born in Los Angeles, Monterey Park, right down the street. I was born in 1978. My family moved to the Inland Empire in the late 90s. My uncle died in 1989. He had AIDS. I was 12 years old. And we watched him pass away pretty atrocically, pretty, pretty terribly. It was, it was a terrible thing to watch as being a 12-year-old kid. My uncle was a great man. He was very good. At, uh, he was an accountant, very successful. And to watch him get very sick and pass away with AIDS in a time where they didn't know a lot about AIDS. It was 1989. We didn't even know that he passed away of AIDS. Our family told us that he passed away of pneumonia because we didn't understand, they didn't really get what was going on. And so in that, it really shook my foundation of seeing my family fall apart, my mom, uh, my grandparents, just, you know, my grandfather's only son. And it really is impactful to me of being the only son in my family. And uh, my two, I have two sisters. And so when I got older, Proposition 215 came up. I was a sophomore, I'm sorry, I was a junior in high school, and there was a ballot going on, and it was for medical marijuana. So, you know, being a anarchist kid in high school, I was like, yeah, I'll get some signatures for marijuana, I'll do this. So uh, I went and I got started getting signatures around my local town, I turned 18, and then I was able to vote, and so I voted for it. My history teacher said that if I brought back a slip saying that I voted, that she would help me pass that class, because I had F's in all my classes, I was a terrible student. And so uh, I went and I voted for two things that year. I voted yes for Proposition 215, I voted yes for Bill Clinton, and so and I left. And I brought that paper, I passed my class, and Prop 215 became an active thing. I started to learn about the movement of medical marijuana. I was already, you know, selling weed and doing stuff like that as a kid, being an anarchy kid in school and doing these things. But it didn't really make sense, even recognizing that it was for the medical marijuana movement, that it was founded on AIDS and cancer. It still didn't make sense to me personally that it was, it, my uncle didn't really sit on my face yet of that's what this movement was about. And so when I was a sophomore in high school, a teacher's asking me if we can write a report, a controversial report. Some people wrote about Hitler, and that's where I actually learned about eugenics and breeding, was a student in my class taught us about what Hitler did, which is terrible, but it was pretty controversial. And so I wrote about mushrooms and shamans, and I was 14 in high school. I don't know where this came from, and I just kind of felt like this has been my past since the beginning of my life. I was 11, and I couldn't believe that Jimi Hendrix was playing the Star Spangled Banner with 10 hits of acid in his bandana, and that was pretty intriguing to me as an artist and as somebody in the visionaries. You know, I do believe in the Aztec culture and Toltec vis visionary images very much in my culture as a kid. So uh, all these things just started to wrap itself around of what was happening. And, you know, once again, we're selling, we're selling weed, and we started meeting patients. And these patients were really sick. And we started to understand that cannabis was very important, and it was what Proposition 215 was actually about. And it was about helping sick and dying patients and how they would actually go across, either pass, or if they pass through their ailment, and they actually get better, and they come back to, to life and become a normal person of society. You know, this does happen with stage three, stage four, cancer, AIDS patients. We have seen people come out of their deathbeds. We do believe a lot of it comes from cannabis. We make oils, you know, Phoenix Tears, people know it as Rick Simpson oil. Um, I have a product that we call it NHO, Native Healing Oils, and I've been making my product for over 10 years. And so we have a good history on how these products work with people that are passing away, dosages. Uh, we don't use edibles or, or smoke flowers. When, when you go into a hospital and somebody's got oxygen tubes in their face, you can't really light a joint, can't light a bong in the room. So you had to add other means of helping these patients. And so that's what Dennis Perone meant to me, is to understand how we can deliver the medicine across you know, he was working with Brownie Mary, and she was giving out, you know, brownies to the AIDS patients in San Francisco at the time, and that's what was really important. And we had to deliver the, the care back into the healthcare system because these people are, are are us, they're our loved ones, they're our brothers, our sisters, our our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents, they're our friends down the street, they're the guy at the liquor store that always smiles at us when we get our water or our papers. You know, these people are important. They live real lives, 
And so I just wanted to touch into that, and into the medicine, and what it was doing to me, how it was impacting me. And so I started to help these people, and the network just got really big, helping multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, uh, sickle cell anemia. We've helped quite a few uh, pretty bad ailments, all the cancers you can think about from Agent Orange to ailments to a bunch of things. Cannabis helped a lot, from topicals to edibles to smoking to vapes. We, cannabis in general just helped. And so uh, mushrooms weren't really legal, never really have been. And so I've already known, because I've been taking mushrooms since I was a kid, it's been a very healing thing to me. I, was, I really much loved, the, I, I enjoyed the space. It made a lot of sense to me personally. You know, living in the projects in Southern California, I've seen a lot of turmoil with law enforcement and friends getting caught up in drugs and passing away and murders and stuff. And so it really impacted me as a youth of what was going to be my next step in life, of not to get swallowed up by the ghetto. And so mushrooms and acid really did a lot. To the, this was in the mid-90s. There was a huge cult wave of the, at the time that was happening, and the culture was really coming forth that psychedelics were part of that movement. And so I, I tapped into that world as a young kid. And it changed my foundation. I saw new worlds. I tapped into my beautiful friends that are here that are doing the production and showing the world what we can do. And they, they really showed me an outlet of how to get out of the turmoil, which we just get stuck in our face every day when we wake up. And psychedelics broke me through that. And so helping these cancer and AIDS patients, some of them would beat their cancer. Their AIDS wouldn't be holding them anymore. They would get out of deathbeds. Wasting syndrome would be gone. And they would start trying to figure out, what is my next step in life? I'm supposed to die and be dead. Or, I was never supposed to be sick, this isn't who I am. And so the medicine actually made a lot of sense to me because we can make people feel good and laugh and it helps with depression and these things, but realistically depression is very, very deep. We have people shooting schools and random shootings and people are, are just, you know, the, the word that's being spread around all over the place is savages now. And, and realistically, savages didn't exist. They came out from the hills and they slaughtered and then they left. Unfortunately, they're every day in our face and we can't get away from them. And sometimes we're the savages. And so how do we, how do we break down this? How do we, how do we demise our ego? How do we d dissolve what we've been told of society? How do, we, how do we not, you know, own a nice house on the hill and have a nice Lexus and Mercedes? And how, how come we don't have those things? And why do we beat our head every day against the people that we see every day that are successful in these places? That's not our life. It's not our, it's not our term. It's not our place. Don't care about what other people have. And the medicine has shooken that away from me. Put me into a space that I can respect and love myself give honor to myself, forgive myself, and in that love the people that love me and care about them around me. So when medical cannabis was doing these people, these people didn't feel any of those things. There was no inspiration, there was no passion, there was no love, there was no life. And it really killed me knowing that medical marijuana can help these people stop feeling like complete shit. And once you give them the dose and they come back to normal and they feel a little bit better, they start laughing and joking, they, they want to eat something, and it really puts them back to normal. And it was a space that really I, I fell in love with, helping thousands of people pass. And thousands of more people get better and live their life. And it actually changed one day. I went to help a gentleman that was in his 80s. He was an ex-Marine Corps drill sergeant. His two sons and his daughter asked me to come and help, bring him some, some weed. And I get into the house, and he's in hospice, and a couch, uh, in a bed in the living room. And I walk up and he asked me what my name was. I said, my name is Eddie, nice to meet you. And he said his name, well, I don't, I'm sorry, but I don't remember his name, but he said his name and he was a gunnery sergeant listed 50 things of entitlement of the US military that he was part of. And he asked me, why was I there? I said, your kids asked me to come bring you some medicine that can help because you're not a doctor. Is this the kid with weed? Get him out of my house. And the daughter said, this is my house, dad. We want to help you. Four hours later, that gentleman was dead. And we sat there in the house, that space, this gentleman laying in a hospice bed there. And I'm sitting there with a joint, holding this joint. And this, father, this guy's dead, and his three children are crying. And I lit the joint. I honestly figured right there in that moment, if I lit this joint and this guy took this hit, well, where'd he go? He wouldn't have got out of the deathbed. He, was, he died four hours later of me getting there. This was not much you can do to help this person. And so in there, I lit the joint. And I turned around, I looked at the kids, and I passed them the joint. And they said, we can't do that. I haven't smoked weed since college. And I said, what did you guys call me here for? I couldn't save his life. You know, you're very much alive. You got a lot of years to go. You need to understand how to deal with this. And they took a hit with me, and they started laughing. They blew some smoke at their dad. And they started joking. They're like, oh my god, I'm smoking weed with my dad. <laughs> and in that moment, it made a lot of sense to me. Of It wasn't the people that are in the moments of passing. It's the people that are in the moments of still living. I've watched a lot of people die in their 40s, 50s, 60s, their kids in their 10s, 20s, 30s. 
and their kids are very healthy. They've chosen options of vegan or vegetarian diets, healthcare systems, gyms. They started doing things to really impact their life of believing in themselves and not falling in the healthcare system. And now I'm afraid these people that are going to be here for 50, 60 years have to remember for 50 or 60 years how their loved one passed away. And that's where the shamans came in. The shamans started to talk to me and to communicate with me. And they started to come out of the jungles of Mexico and South America. And they said, hey, we keep hearing about your name helping people in America. I mean, his name is Dr. Jerry. They just did a piece on him on Viceland. He did 5-MeO-DMT. This is a good friend of mine. And we were got into contact with each other and he came to help me with the visionary group in Washington and we gave this medicine to some patients and we actually wiped years and years away. We actually said 50,000 hours of therapy was wiped away in a 15 minute session. I've watched people get rebirthed over and over. I've done it myself. It's an amazing medicine. I do believe it's for a lot of people. I don't believe it's for everyone because it comes with support, understanding. And so in that, the visionary healing that this doctor was able to bring me, everybody called him a shaman. They all had these questions and he had nothing but questions for us. He's like, I, I, you have a question, well, I have a question. Your, your question is, I'm from the jungles of Mexico. You know, I don't know about a fancy car working in a cubicle, you know, traffic and road rage. I, I don't take ayahuasca for those things. I take ayahuasca so the visionary elders tell me what the world needs to heal itself. And a lot of people are lost in the spirit world. And so me, I'm just trying to connect into that. I'm not trying to be here for everybody. I'm just trying to be there for the people that have tapped into that communication because I have tapped into it myself. And in this world, there's a lot of people that have seen these things make a lot of sense. And in that, I want to make sure that we can deliver this with respect, with honor, with you know, true questionality. We don't have the answers. We're going to question you along with us. We have some answers for some things that we've been through, and it's definitely helped us in our stages. So when the CPLI came to me and they said, hey, they came to me in August, and they said, we, we want to help decriminalize psilocybin. And I told them, uh, you have to get this person and this person before I uh, even give you the time of day. And so a few months go by, and he reaches out again, and he says, hey, you still want to be part of this thing? And I already knew from reaching out to some of the people that I was colleagues with about the people that I asked them to reach out for. And one person isn't in the state of California, so he was super irrelevant. The other person was. And he already communicated with Kevin. And so I didn't think that he was going to be on board. And so Alan Rockefeller actually was definitely on board to help with the psilocybin de decriminalization. We're going to dec decriminalize psilocybin. We want you to be able to have mushrooms in your pocket, and the cops don't put you in jail for it. You know, we want to make sure that we can get research and open communication on what psychedelic mushrooms actually do. And just in general, what do psychedelics do? From helping cancer patients, I have a, I, she, was, she was 52 at the time of the treatment. She had breast cancer. She was a beautiful lady. She looked like Dolly Parton. And you'd walk in her home, and she had trophies all over her house. She entered beauty pageants since she was a child. She got breast cancer, and she had a double mastectomy. She lost all of her teeth from chemo radiation. She took Phoenix Tears, Rick Simpson Oil, our NHO. She took this stuff for a while. She, she beat her cancer. She's completely remit. She has, she has, it's not, no longer in her. It's gone. But when she walks by herself and she sees a reflection in their mirrors, she actually has a panic attack because she doesn't recognize the stranger in her house. She doesn't even know who she is. She lost all of her hair. She had a double mastectomy. She looked like Dolly Parton, long, blonde, beautiful hair. She said she'd open her door and there'd be flowers every day by all the men that would throw themselves at her. And all the women would, be, would hate her because she was so beautiful. And now she didn't want to go outside because she was a mutant. How was she supposed to live? She didn't have cancer. She wasn't, she wasn't in tremendous pain and torture anymore of her body. But in her mind, she was still lost. She would walk by her TV, and the TV would turn off, and she would freak out of the mirror. She didn't have mirrors. She took all the glass off of all of her, her pictures in her house. And then one day, I just said, well, hey, um, like always, why don't you smoke a joint? And she goes, when I smoke a joint, it makes me depressed. Because I want to laugh, and there's nothing to laugh at. I, I, look, I don't have any teeth. You know, I, I, have, I can't put on my clothes I grew up in. I don't even want to look at my pictures in my house anymore, because that's not me. I said, well, have you ever thought about, you know, visionary medicines? And she didn't know what I was talking about. And I told her about mushrooms. And she, you know, freaked out and panicked, of course, because stigmatism, propaganda, and how it's, you know, we're all going to end up on somewhere that's other than where we end up. And that's loving ourselves in a great place of loving other people. And so when we gave her the medicine, it shook her foundation. And she met the doc. And she took the 5-MeO-DMT. And it changed her life. And the lady, we haven't, we haven't seen her in a few years. And she's doing very well. She, does uh, support groups in Venice Beach and in Santa Monica. She was doing this a few years ago. And she actually likes to help people now from going to treatment for breast cancer and how to look at the other options 
like psychedelics and medical cannabis and these other tools that utilized that she utilized and actually helped her get through her life and all of her problems. And so in the visionary medicine has definitely shown me that th this is nothing new. I I'm actually talking from cave carvings on the walls in Peru and in Mexico. The Aztec culture knew this. The Spaniards came and they burned all the libraries. They didn't want us to understand that we connect to spirituality that make us believe in ourselves. And in that we create for others. Because if we could stand tall and proud and not lean on one another, then we do stand tall and proud. And if one of us today, we get a little tired and I got to lean on one of you guys, it's okay because you're doing tall and proud today and tomorrow you got to stand you can lean on. But they don't teach that in our society. They don't show that in our culture. Healthcare, pharmaceuticals, they don't, they don't tell you to love on each other. They don't even teach you nothing. You go into a cubicle room now, you wait with a bunch of normal people. This doctor goes from office to office to office. They give you the same medications. They don't actually tap into you. They don't know who you are. So I start ask, telling my patients this. Why don't you turn around and start asking the doctor, what do you do, doc? You look pretty healthy. You're pretty successful. You got a lot of nice plaques and certificates in my waiting room. I sat there for four hours to see you. So man, how do I be successful like you? How does this work, man? Because I don't want to see you anymore. <laughs> you know? And, and I've, nine out of 10 patients, the doctors have said, shut up, you don't talk to me. Not in so many words, but one of them said those words, shut up, you don't talk to me. This is about you and your treatment. It's not about me and my life. You know, in 1755, you would have sent your child into the village on a horse and it took him two or three days to see the doctor. And the doctor would have made time. He probably wouldn't have even been in the, ho in the office. He'd have left a note. The doctor would have came back after helping somebody. He'd have got on his horse and he'd came to your place. When he walked into your house and your property, he seen that you weren't tending your garden and your cattle was all gone and your pigs were no longer there and your fat ass was sitting on your couch and he wasted his three days to get to you and you decided to eat disgustingly and it put you in this space and you wasted his time. He would slap you in the face and tell you, you wasted my time. You should go outside and tend to your garden. Stop eating your animals that fertilize your fruits and vegetables. And in that, you'll find clarity, you'll find peace, you'll find health. And he won't bother me because there's a guy over there who needs to get his leg cut off right now. And that's super more important. His infection is more important than how you decided to take advantage of the things that have been put in your face. Help others. And now you'll help yourself. So once again, when CPI came, I wanted to just make sure that I could deliver this message across. I brought Christian Kalin up here, down here from Pacific Northwest, from Washington, a few years ago with medical cannabis. I've been in it since Proposition 215 started in 1995. A few years ago, I left. Ed Rosenthal put me in his grow books. I've been in numerous grow books with Ed Rosenthal. I do research with Ed Rosenthal. Um, he's a very good mentor to me. Dennis Perone is a good mentor. I have Richard Eastman sitting here right now to represent Dennis Perone. And it's truly, Proposition 215 is a very delivery heavy passion of my life of help, helping and healing people. Dennis called it a very good thing, the Compassionate Use Act. Well, CPLI, I'm going to carry the Compassionate Use Act with me personally because I've watched mushrooms help with cannabis, with ayahuasca, with DMT, with LSD, and with peyote, personally. It hasn't been done in America. We've done this in other countries because we know the laws here. But that's why we're bringing this initiative. We have to change the laws here. We need to stop having mass shootings. We need to stop having mass depressions. We need to quit having savages, and we need to start having some loving going on and people caring again. And the research is changing now. And so I hope we can do that today. So when I moved to Washington and I learned about mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms were growing in my backyard. And uh, it's pretty interesting. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I'm from right here, you guys. Psychedelic mushrooms in your backyard, front yard. I mean, come on, what mushrooms do you find out here, you guys? And actually, we found some, and Alan Rockefeller's at the mushroom fair, and he's coming down with the specimens that we found at the uh, UC Botanical Gardens, yes, UCR Botanical Gardens, because we want to show what local mushrooms grow around here. But sorry, guys, there's no psilocybes growing here. So we have no psychedelic <laughs> mushrooms uh, that grow naturally south of, of here. They actually, some big Sur, Santa Cruz North, you can actually stumble upon, upon quite a few of them and, and get the healing that you can from nature. And so uh, when I got to Washington, I started just search for just mushrooms, chanterelles, edible culinary mushrooms, morels, uh, lobster mushrooms, lion's mane. All these things were really interesting to me. I wanted to find, I didn't even know, like lion's mane was a real trippy mushroom. Christian, I'm sure, will show it in a slideshow here next. And you're going to actually see one of the most interesting looking mushrooms I've ever seen. And to witness it in nature is amazing. And they call it like a smart mushroom, helps with Alzheimer's and dementia. We believe it has a lot of, they call polysacchar polysaccharides and beta glutens. And these are positive proteins and sugars that actually battle and attack 
that they help the immune system to battle tumors and bad cells in the body and inflammation. So we're trying to bring over these mushrooms like reishi and shiitakes and these other mushrooms that are culinary mushrooms that are, make your dinner very good, but you can also brew a tea with them and start battling your flus instead of taking all these chemicals and, and all these medications that they're putting in the, in the in that Walmart that you see right in front of your face. If you see it right in front of your face, somebody's paying a lot of money for the lie they're putting inside that box. So if you just did a little bit more research and started to find the people that didn't have that much money to put a pretty package on it, they had too much money to put in their product. Those people are out there. We have to reverse think. We have to reverse think because they don't think we think like They know we don't think like that. We're lazy. We're, con we're, we're, we're trying to be convenient. Or, or, we're trying to get out of rush hour. And they are taking advantage of that. And in that, we die very quickly. And our people that have recognized this, they stay longer than us. They recognize the falls that we do. I don't work as hard as my father, and I never will. And in that, my dad works himself to death. And so my children, it's amazing to see what they're going to create and what they're going to happen. But that's what we need to do for our kids, is to show them that we live in society, we have to learn how to work and mend inside of it, but it can't overwhelm me and take me out to where I want to go and load up a gun, shoot out some windows in the 34th floor, take out a bunch of country singers and a bunch of good people just listen to a good time. That's just what, I don't understand that. I don't get that. You can line all those people. That guy, you should bring that shooter to me. Let's give him six hours of ayahuasca. Let's give him a 5-MeO-DMT trip. Let's, let's, let's kill that man's ego to believe that he had to cripple other souls. <laughs> Thank you. But instead, they're gonna, instead, he shot himself. Good job, whatever. The other guys got away, whatever. It's conspiracy, whatever. But the big people that lost is the community, is us. Big questions of why, how come? Where? What if? Where's next? I don't care if you did it right now. My piece that I've took with the medicine knows that we are our ball of energy. We leave with nothing here at all. Everything that we've tried to do, we all chose to be here in life. I come from a Catholic background, a Christian background. My grandparents are Christian, Catholic. I was raised very heavily religious. And I do believe the one thing is that we're all taught that we're here and we're created from sin. And then we have to always pray that we need to just be better every day to just try. And what I've learned from taking all these medicines is that's not true. Is that we're born from creation. We decided to come here today to help the earth and the people that we interact with. This is why we're here. And the more that we can connect to that, the more we find out that other people figure that out too. And then we all help each other. And the ones that don't, we don't need to worry about them. And one day they'll wake up, let them find themselves in their tribes. Let's recognize the ones that have recognized me right now. Because I recognize you, I believe in you, if you believe in me. And I thank all you guys for coming out here to listen to all these lectures. They're very important to me. And I just want to uh, get to a few points because I kind of got a little off track. <laughs> but uh, we're on Facebook Live, and so they have some messages coming through they want me to check also. And uh, if you guys have any questions or stuff like that, we're going to be taking them. But right now, real fast, I'm going to jump on here and see... Well, if anybody can go on to my feed on the Eddie Funkster page to see if there's any questions that are pretty good, Kevin, or somebody, that'd be a lot quicker than me reading a lot of these things. I would like to keep the flow going. And so we have set up at the two booths, as soon as you come in, if you're not registered in the state of California, you can register yourself. We are set up to Wi-Fi, and you can register the state, and you can sign the CPLI initiative. If you want to be a signature gatherer in your area, in your region, in Southern California, you'll be in contact with me to pick them up April 10th to April 12th, I believe, so that we can get them to Kevin, so we can drop them off in the, the prospective counties. I'm going to probably try to reach out to Kevin and, and Kitty to see if I can take over the ones for Riverside, San Bernardino, and San Diego counties, and I, I'll try to take those in, maybe Imperial County also, so they can only focus on the north. So we're trying to work on ways to make this happen. Mental health is a very big thing. Holidays just left, and it was really hard for a lot of people to sit there with their family. But hey, if they could have took a microdose of some you know, psilocybin at, and at, as soon as they walked in the door, I'm pretty sure you're going to have a really interesting, you know, Christmas dinner or a New Year's party or a, <laughs> something to be thankful on Thanksgiving, you know, it would have, have been a real good piece because my, my, you're going to hear some, some really good mycologists and mushroom experts and my passion of it has been completely an enthusiast. I love them. They showed me so much love and so my whole passion of it isn't from a research standpoint or a scientific back point, it's a background. It comes from a complete, hey, I don't know, try this. They're still alive. They're smiling. They're not crying anymore. We're doing great. And so in that, some of the people are crying. They're not doing great, and we're still working on them. So this isn't a one dose, one drop, and everybody's fine. This is, we have to understand a lot of support. There's tons of community out there. I know there's a lot of people here 
that work in these cubicles all over downtown Los Angeles and pay three to five thousand dollars to go to Peru, South America, Costa Rica. They try to go to Brazil and take ayahuasca and do these visionary retreats. And those people are actually here. The medicine is here. It does. It, it will get across. Ayahuasca has screamed out from the jungle and said that the, the world needs it. There's too many lost souls in our spirit world. We need to connect more because we need to build in that world because we, we, it, this is just one step. That's the great endeavor is death. Who knows where we go? Nobody even understands that. And that's the next building of life. But what we do here really makes sense of what we place there. And if we can just love more here, those people are going to be waiting there for us. And if not, I'm waiting for them when, I, when they get there. And so in that, I'm just trying to express that. Psychedelics have done that for me. Visionary medicine has done that to me. Watching cancer and AIDS patients get through their ailments and get over things has really showed me a point that, you know, being in a deathbed isn't where life ends. I know people that are in a deathbed right now, sitting in their office, sitting in their car right now on the 101 freeway, sitting in traffic on Beverly Boulevard, sitting right outside on that sidewalk right now asking for change. And they're not all on a deathbed. Some are doing very well, living, trying to figure out how to keep stepping. Psychedelics really wash away those walls, take away those bridges and put us on a platform of what's next. They show us the future. They give us the future. Mushrooms, they grow a few times. You, know, you can find certain parts of the region in the world where they grow constantly. They're always going. Because I do believe they understand that we need the healing all the time. You know, psychedelic mushrooms only follow us. I, when I lived in Washington, I went to the rainforest. I tried to go hike and find, you know, the most exotic psychedelic mushroom. Let me go deep into the forest, four-hour hike, waterfalls, and this and that. I found nothing, nothing but, but conifer conchs. I found anything. And then my friend's like, dude, why don't you just, you know, go to the local trail? And I did. And there they were, the local trail. Like, oh, my God. And you know what they told me? You try too hard. <laughs> Why don't you just stop and just enjoy what's right in front of you? It's this moment right now. And I smoke weed, and weed slows me down to enjoy the moment, but in the weed, what do I do? I try to advance constantly and show I'm a productive stoner. <laughs> so I keep stepping over the mushrooms. So I had to really pay attention to things. And out there, you know, I, I, when I was mushroom hunting, I actually ran into a group, and, you know, being from, from here, in Washington, there's a forest everywhere you turn around, and it's amazing. You don't have to go to the Arboretum, or you don't have to go to HPG, or you don't have to go to a botanical garden. It's, you're in a botanical state, and it's amazing. And so every, every day I took advantage after I was done, I was setting up a medical marijuana grow to a recreational marijuana program, and every time I got off of work, I went mushroom hunting. And in that, I started finding chanterelles, lobster mushrooms, these things. My wife started cooking us dinner, and my kids started eating the mushrooms we were foraging out of the woods, and then one day, I walked into the normal foraging spot, and this lady and this gentleman come walking through with their dog, and they asked me really politely, because they noticed me looking around the ground, because when you mushroom hunt, you just do this all over the place. You never, watch out, you run into trees, you run into branches, and the lady's like, what are you doing? I said, we're mushroom hunting, and she was like, oh, well, can you please be careful? Uh, good friends of ours had a foraging party, and they, three out of the five died. One of the mushrooms that they ate dissolved the liver, and... They weren't here, so can you please be careful on what you harvest, what you forage from the forest? And that day, I took a step back from the forest, and I went home, and I jumped on my computer, and I started typing in things of what was the difference of things, and what were the mushrooms, what was going on. I started educating myself. And in cannabis, we know about OG Kush, Sour Diesel, Blue Dream, blah, blah, blah. We know about these things, right? Rutilis, Sativa, Indica. We're, we're geniuses. We're all chemists around here, man. We're all botanists. But in mushrooms, there's over six million fungi in the family. Imagine six million titles for cannabis, not just indica, sativa, or ruralis. Six million titles of those, and then family members from those family members. And only out of like 200 of those have been found to be psilocybes. I know there's probably a few more, but the research isn't completely solid, and they've only been documented of two to, I'm sure Alan will be here pretty soon. He's going to be here pretty soon. He's going to explain to you how many psilocybes are actually cataloged out of six million. And what Alan Rockefeller does is a DNA sequencer of mushrooms. So you find a mushroom, and I find a mushroom. We send them to Alan, and he breaks them down for a DNA analysis. And we both send them in, and we say, hey, this is this mushroom. And he says, no, it's not. The DNA sequence does not match up. This is a completely different mushroom. Let me put it in the gen bank of the world of genes. And let's find out if it showed up in Australia, or Sweden, or Switzerland. Is it, is it, a, is it related to anybody else in the world? And that's what Alan Rockefeller does. And so his research really made a lot of sense to me of how I should bring them here and explain to you guys of what these mushrooms look like. Because of me trying to figure out which ones were the psychedelic mushrooms, the funny mushrooms, and which ones were the edible ones for me to make sure my family can eat a good 
nutritional dinner and the ones that can just kill you. Really made a lot of sense to me in a forest where they grow all over the place. And then being from here in LA, what do you think? You think every mushroom's edible when you get to the forest because you see all these mushrooms. And you're like, wow, that's a pretty one. I can eat this one. That's a, oh, wow. And then you find, oh, that one will give you the runs. This one will give you stomach cramps. You're like, oh, this one will give you a headache for three days. That one, you won't come back. Like, oh, shit. All right. This is really, this is interesting. This is intriguing. And then the deeper I got into it, I started finding out that they can actually, they found mushrooms that eat plastic and they're trying to get rid of the trash island in the Pacific Ocean from Fukushima. And oyster mushrooms can do this. The Plastoris family can actually eat plastics. Not only that, but Paul Stamets did a research in Mason County in Washington where they had a bunch of farms and the runoff was contaminating the local sound and the waters and they couldn't actually drink their water and they had to, all Mason County couldn't use it because of the salmonella poisoning and all the other bacteria that was coming down from the local farms. So Paul Stamets started to do some research with with uh, oyster mushrooms also, and he started to put them together in, in big hay bales, and he plugged up all of the drains that went into the, into the rivers with just mycelium. He was able to filter all of the bad toxins with the mycelium, completely dropped all of his bacteria levels in his part of the sound. And now it's part of the standards in Washington State if you have a farm and you're on the Puget Sound that you have to utilize this system. You don't have to, but it's an option that you can use, and it's a completely natural source of cleaning up your water runoffs. Mushrooms are amazing. They're part of us. We're part of them. They, um, Paul Stamets actually say that they have an external stomach and their fruited body is the brain or something like that. I won't say that word for word, but we, we have a stomach internally. We eat food, we digest it internally. Mushrooms, they do it all externally. So mushrooms, mycelium, the way it all comes together, each little branch that comes together is actually like a scientist right there. So each one of us would be a branch breaking out. And if something landed on me or Kevin or Marnie or you, and we never heard about it and it was new to one of us and we took it apart and we had to figure out this is food. It landed on me, I gotta eat it. That's the only way I can't get rid of it, I gotta eat it. So mushrooms figure out this is what it is. It starts putting all these enzymes and proteins into it and it starts breaking down whatever this is. And as soon as that one researcher, whether it's me, him, or her, as soon as it figured out how to turn this into food and nutrients, instantaneously every one of us knows how. And if any one of these particulates fall on any one of us, whether it falls over there or falls over here, he already figured it all out. Instantly, we start processing this product. This is how mushrooms work. This is how when we take them into our bodies, start building our immunities, and they start helping us. Cancer patients going through chemo, this helped tremendously. Mushroom teas, mushroom tinctures, you know, edible mushrooms, just bringing up the immunities in them to help build the lymphocytes and, and actually the natural killer cells to build them up. So we understood these things. This is the next wave of medicine. It's just plants. It's not even next. It's not even new. It's just erasing all the propaganda of people that just didn't understand them and were afraid. There's tons of communication now. There's countries all over the world that are know that we're doing. We're teaching people how these plants are communicating with us because they're just, they're just not killing us and they're not making us kill a bunch of people. And the government knows that this is how they make money. They find products out of plants. They brand it. They market it. They dilute it, and in that we get sold to it. So I just want you to understand you can grow these products in your backyard. In Proposition 215, we taught a bunch of cancer and AIDS and normal people, patients, just people how to grow their own medicine. There's so much cannabis in the world now today because of Proposition 215 that this next medicine that you can have in your cabinet is right here, right now. Let's just decriminalize it and stop people from saying you can't have these products in your, th in your hands. You can't have these things on you. We're grown adults. We can do whatever we want. As long as we're not hurting anybody, I believe. So, we want to take some questions and answers. Did we have any of them from the thing? Yeah, what did you have? We asked, is growing mushrooms um, economical or cost efficient and environmentally efficient? I, if mush, growing mushrooms are cost efficient, environmentally efficient, somewhere around those lines? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, and yes, and I am not that guy. Christian Kalin's going to be coming up here at, in the next 15 minutes or so, and he's going to be teaching about farming production, and he understands all that and how to set up a farm, how much it costs per acre or so, so, whatever. I don't know if he has those specs, but he grows on a huge mushroom farm in Olympia, Washington, that I physically have walked on, have done mushroom transfer of agar and cultures, and he's shown me all stages of mushroom growth and, and how to actually production do. He ran a farmer's market. And when I met Paul Stamets, Paul Stamets told me that he was too busy and he was too passionate in his research for me to find somebody else that he has taught. And when I met Christian Kalin, 
a week later, found out that he actually did the Agaricon studies with Paul Stamets. And so he was part of all of that research. So it's just this fungi world just keeps connecting all of us to the right people in the right places. And so I brought him down here today because we don't understand how to farm in Los Angeles County the way Christian farms on his five acres in the Capitol Forest in Washington. It's amazing. You walk on his property and you're standing on trees, old growth forest. He's grown a, a shard out of his garden. That was amazing lettuce. I've had shiitake mushrooms that he's grown that we've been, and it's amazing, super nutrition, amazingly healthy people and living healthy lifestyles of life. And I brought him here today to hopefully show us how we can change, you know, how we just live within ourselves. So one more question, then we have a Facebook Live. I'm going to do an interview. When I go off, uh, I'm actually behind the scenes behind here and I'm doing interviews for people that are on Facebook Live. Uh, my production team that's here has been working over the last 30 years in Hollywood. They've been making movies and they worked with uh, Tonight Show with uh, Johnny Carson and they come from a very heavy background of production and film and uh, they're still actively very heavily in Hollywood. So all the production you're seeing right now on my Facebook Live is coming from this production team and we're actually going to make this a post thing. We're going to have it on YouTube with all of the letterheads and all the images. When it's going to look like you're watching it on the news station. So it's pretty, pretty fun how they do things and they're just having a good time. Yes? Hi, I'm Paul Paulson. Yes. Um, Thank you. I'm I'm not, uh, Kitty was the one that helped write the initiative. She actually wrote it. Her and Kevin are the authors of it. And so uh, I'm pretty sure they can have a good part of that answer. They'll be walking around here. My personal passion of why I'm delivering the decriminalization part of it is just because it was uh, a dream we wanted for, for cannabis. Jack Hare wanted decriminalization across the board. It released my prisoners. Uh, stop, make it to where it's, it's free completely. Don't make no money off of cannabis. And that's what Jack Hare believed. And so I come from that heavy background of him and Dennis Brown. Dennis Brown wanted cannabis to be in a store, on a shelf with the herbs and spices. I do believe mushrooms should be on that shelf too. You know, I was in Amsterdam in smart shops buying, you know, Mexicanas, Kibensens, fresh, a smart shop. So I, I'm, I ate them. I walked around the canals. I didn't fall in one. I didn't, you know, go rape anybody in the red light. I didn't, you know, strangle any police or cause any tourism problems. I actually had a great time and, and really tripped on the canals and on a ride. It was really fun and a great time. So in that, I, I just, I feel that medicinal part of it, yeah, Dennis McKenna is killing it in Massachusetts right now, psilocybin research on a, FD, on a federal level. And he's going to do it to a level to where your grandparents, your mother no longer gets, gets prescribed Prozac or barbiturates or these crazy pharmaceuticals that make them a zombie or out of place. And Dennis McKenna is doing that work to where she can actually get this medication in this, in this platform. But let's just be honest, in the grassroots movement, they're plants. A lot of us learned how to grow them. And we shouldn't be put in jail because we like to grow a, a tub full of cabenzines while we go to work and pay our taxes and you know, drive a car. And on Saturday, I need to wash my mind away so I don't go strangle my boss on Monday. Like, that's, my boss should be encouraged. He should be here signing these things because, <laughs> man, straight up, man, it's like, You'll have a better employee, man. You'll be a better boss. You'll have a better system. And so in that, I'm just trying to tap into that because it's just nothing but love. And I understand all that. It's not for everybody. So if it's not for you, cool, goodbye. But don't say it's not for this person or that person because I don't know them. And <laughs> neither do you. So give them the right to choose or not because you have the right to say, no, I don't want this. So I'm not going to. So just sign it, please. Nice. We have attorney to go. Nice. We'll get you set up, definitely. Yeah, some legal questions. So we'll have her, we'll get her all set up and we'll have everybody able to talk with her. So we have a we have a legal attorney here to talk about Yes. So thank you guys for coming to my visionary meet and greet and everything mushroom workshop. Uh, Christian's going to come on here and teach you guys about culinary mushrooms and medicinal mushrooms and farming and he's got an amazing slide presentation. This is, you know, I grow cactus and I like, I love mushrooms and I grow weeds. So this is, this is who I am. So. <laughs>
You know, trans the flowers are transmitting from the universe. So that's kind of, I'm Eddie Funksta. That's my stuff. So I appreciate you guys very much. I'm going to go in here and answer some people on Facebook Live in this little back room. Uh, my brother Willie is going to play some amazing sounds. We're going to set Christian up. You guys can use the restrooms, get a drink real quick. Um, appreciate you guys' time and attention very, very much. And uh, my son Fabian's on live right now. You guys are seeing my son Fabian in about three, two, some. And I'll see you guys in a minute. God bless.